Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Reflection Church. We are so glad that you have joined us on this beautiful Easter Sunday. My name is Miranda, and I serve as the Connections Director here. We would love to get connected with you. If today is your first time with us, then go ahead and comment where you're from. We would love to hear from you. You can also text the word welcome to the number below or click on the link for our comment card. Here at Reflection Church, we believe we are called to disciple the found and reflect Christ to the lost. If you would like to join in this vision with us, either as a member or as someone new to our congregation, there's a giving link in the comments below. You can also text REFLECT to the number on the screen or mail cash or check to Reflection Church. Thank you guys for joining us. We are so excited to get started. Let's grab our Bibles and notebooks and lean into today's message. Hi everyone, Pastor Benjamin and Tiffany here. We are so excited that you're gonna be joining us for Easter Sunday today. We pray that it's a meaningful and excellent experience as we worship our risen Lord. God bless you all. Good morning and welcome to Reflection Church on this Easter Sunday. Why don't you take a moment just to type in these words, say them to the person next to you. This is a kind of a creedal chant that has been proclaimed throughout the church's history. Say this, Christ has died. Repeat that, Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Christ has died. Christ is risen and Christ will come again. That is the hope that we have on this Easter Sunday as we continue our New View series. I'm praying last week blessed you and spoke to you, and I'm excited to dive into the Word of God this Sunday. So go ahead and grab your Bibles, turn them to John chapter 20, verses 1 through 9. That's my assignment for today, John chapter 20, verses 1 through 9. Reading from the ESV here. When you have it, type in amen, please. And if you don't have it, it'll be on the screen so you can fake it. John chapter 20, verses 1 through 9. Now, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. I want to speak to you this Easter Sunday from this subject, a closer look, a closer look. Go ahead and type that in in the comments, a closer look. Go ahead and announce that to the neighbor, to the right or left of you, six feet though, social distancing, a closer look. Preceding our text, we see and find the disciples who are discouraged, who are afraid for their own lives, but certainly for the one who they followed. For they had given their life to this Jesus, this messianic figure that they were following after, all their hopes and dreams placed in him. And each time the nails went in, the whip crossed his body, the cross upon his back. With each step, their dreams died, their hopes vanished. And with the buried body of Jesus laid their hopes and their dreams. Mary Magdalene was no different. She was not one of the twelve, but she was a follower of Jesus. For Jesus had delivered Mary from seven demons who tormented her. And Jesus set her free and gave her her life back. 
And you know that when Jesus sets you free and gives you your life back, one of the things you want to do is just say, I'm here for you. I'll serve you. I'll do whatever. I know what my life was like, and now I know what my life is like and the freedom I am experiencing, and I just want to give my life to you. That was Mary. When many of the 12 disciples hid while Jesus was being tortured and executed, Mary stayed at the foot of the cross. And in our text, she is the first one to arrive to Jesus' tomb early in the morning. Our text here in verses 1 and 2 reveals a theme that I want to draw on from these two verses. And it's this theme, darkness. Darkness. Go ahead and write that down. Darkness. Let's look at verses 1 and 2 again. Now on the first day, somebody say the first day. Of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, this was her conclusion, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. Mary was distressed and emotionally distraught. It was dark, and it was early. But John, here the author of this gospel, records something that's a little bit unique. He says this, now on the first day, on the first day, if you remember throughout Jesus' ministry, he always emphasized that he would rise on the third day. That especially in Mark chapter 8 when he deals with this, that he would rise again on the third day. This was the third day after Jesus had been killed. So, so why is it that John would then write the first day? Perhaps it's because he knew and understood that upon this first day was the birth of something new. That it wasn't just the third day after Jesus' death, but it was a first day. It was a start of something new. It was a start of a new week. It was a start of a new day. And historically, we understand that this first day was the hinge upon which the gospel message itself swings. But Mary was in the dark. And it was early. She had two of these factors working against her. Where, where are my morning people watching in right now? You just wake up and you're ready for the day. That's me. I'm excited. I've had to learn to tone it down because Tiffany, my wife, is not as much of a morning person, and I wake up like Mach 5. I'm ready to go. I'm excited. I want to talk about everything, right? And, and I had to learn that that's not the appropriate time to do that. So, so where are my morning people out there? Just go ahead and comment in. But, but where are my people also who need two or three or four or five cups of coffee or shots of espresso in order to even have a conversation? Because Jesus loves you too this morning, not just the early birds. But, but regardless of what kind of person you are here, Mary had these two factors working against her because of her emotional distress. It's dark, and it's early. The darkness here is more than kind of an explanation of of the sun not being risen yet. The darkness is indicative of Mary's clouded understanding of what's taking place. For it's in this dark and early place that Mary doesn't fully perceive and understand that which Jesus had been teaching his disciples for the past two and a half to three and a half years. Darkness distorts the ability to perceive correctly. And it was in this darkness that Mary said, okay, wait a minute, they've stolen the body. She, she glances in, it's dark, she can't see fully the scene, and rushes to the assumption that Jesus' body has been taken, therefore she just goes off sprinting and running to get Peter and John to have them come and investigate what has happened. The darkness of the morning distorted her ability to perceive what was truly happening. For this was actually a joyous occasion, and yet Mary is saddened. 
This was cause for celebration for the fulfillment of that which Jesus had explained. And yet because it was early and it was dark, Mary did not fully comprehend that which Jesus had prophesied. Darkness distorts our view. As I was writing this message, I I thought about, where where are my iPhone people? If you're an iPhone person, just go ahead and comment in. I, I bless you today for making a great decision. No, I'm kidding. Android folks, I love you too. Flip phone people, God bless you, and I love you too. No discrimination here for what phone that you use. I I just particularly like my iPhone here because it syncs with all my devices and such. So, So iPhone 11 came out with this feature with this iteration of the iPhone, and and they call this photo feature dark mode, dark mode or or night mode. And, And the point of this feature is so that when you're taking pictures in the dark, that which is hidden and pixelated and unable to be clear becomes clear the longer you hold it there and the, and the technology inside to bring light to this dark scene. And I thought about the, the comparison that's there, that's given here in this text. Mary just needed a little bit of light, a little bit of a closer look to perceive what was happening, but she got caught in the dark that distorted her perception, and her ability to perceive what had happened. It requires a new view to see in the dark what's uncertain and what may bring fear. I love that Jesus, in this early and dark morning, chose Mary to be the first to the tomb to arrive on this first day of the week, this hinge point in all of human history. I love that he allowed Mary to be the first one. It it wasn't a religious scholar. It wasn't a, a pastor or priest. It wasn't even one of the 12, but it was a woman who was so captivated by her love and admiration for Jesus that, but She couldn't help but to go one last time to offer homage and worship to the Savior who she loved, who had freed her from oppression, who had freed her from bondage, who had freed her from this tormented life that she lived. It was Mary in the dark of morning who was the first to experience something she didn't fully understand, but that she only caught in part because darkness distorts our view. And this Easter Sunday, Jesus himself invites you out of the darkness. Come on, as a society, we're in a place of darkness. The coronavirus pandemic, quarantine, isolation, not being in our standard routines, things shutting down, jobs uncertain, stock market uncertain, all kinds of factors playing in. It can feel dark, and yet Jesus says, I, I want to give you a new view this Easter. I, I, wanted, I want you not to have your view distorted by darkness, but I have come to bring clarity and light into your situation. Verses 1 and 2 in Mary's journey teach us that darkness distorts our view. But it's not just darkness that inhibits our ability to perceive things rightly. It's also distance. Go ahead and write that down. Comment in distance. Look in verses 3 through 7. So so Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. That's important. He, He did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there and the face cloth which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Once Mary had perceived this reality that Jesus' body had been stolen and taken, she ran 
to Peter and then ran to John to get them, to, to get their attention, to get them to come and to be at this tomb and to witness what she saw. So, so John, the author of this gospel, is believed to be the one who Jesus loved. He's the disciple whom Jesus loved. He has this affectionate title and and addresses himself in the third person here, this disciple whom Jesus loved. And he makes sure to include a little jab at Peter. He said, I'm I'm younger than Peter and I'm faster than Peter. So I got to the tomb before Peter, even though we were both running to the tomb. John arrived at the tomb first. And, and, And the text says he stooped in to this tomb and he only saw the linen cloths there, the, 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 the cloths that were wrapping Jesus' body. And, and he doesn't go in. But Peter, older Peter, in, in correlation to his temperament, he just goes right into the scene without restraint. Here's Peter, and he goes right into the scene, and he goes in for a closer look. John stayed outside at a distance and only perceived and saw the clothes that were wrapping around Jesus' body. Peter went into the tomb, and when he went into the tomb, he not only saw linen cloths, but he saw a head napkin, the the face cloth that was around Jesus' head, tidy and in place. What distorted Mary's view with darkness distorted John's view with distance. For Peter went in for a closer look. And when Peter went in, this is what he realized. This is not the scene of a grave robbery, for they have left these linen cloths that are expensive, and furthermore, this head cloth has been tidily folded separate from the body cloths. This was no scene of a grave robbery. For there was order in this scene. And historians and scholars alike say, after the many you know, robberies of tombs, that, that these grave robbers would kind of desecrate these tombs, this had no semblance of such desecration. But it was a tidy and neat scene. Peter did not stop at the doorstep of the tomb. This word that's used for John, it literally meant that he, that he kind of peeped in. That he just kind of peeked his head in and said, oh, okay, okay, that, that's it. I, I, I can't go in. I, I, can't, I can't look any closer. Perhaps we stay at a distance in life to certain situations, to certain problems, to certain habits, to certain addictions, to certain prayers. Maybe we stay at a distance because we're afraid of what we'll see if we get close. Because when we get close, things that were previously hidden from a distance are exposed. They can't be hidden any longer. Perhaps it was John's great fear that my my Lord, my Savior, the one who I gave my life to, his body's been stolen. And I don't want to go in and see that that's right. I can't handle it emotionally. I, I, I don't even want to go in for a closer look. And yet Peter said, I have to get to the truth of the matter. I need to go in for a closer look. And what Peter found was not that his greatest fear was affirmed, but that his greatest hope was still possible. Maybe Jesus isn't dead. He is, maybe he is alive. So this Easter season... Jesus extends an invitation to me and to you. And he says, come in and look closer. Don't, don't, don't stay on the fringe. Don't, don't stay on the outside. Just, just peeping in quickly at, at what I'm doing and what I'm telling you and what I'm revealing to you and what I want to show you. Don't just stay back and, and kind of peek at it and say, I'll get to it another time. I'll, I'll get to it some other day. I'll, I'll do that another time. No, he invites you to come in closer. Because when you come in closer, what you see is this. Not that all of your hopes and dreams are shattered, but that they are alive because the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is alive and active today and can bring life into your situations. 
Every place that feels dead, every place you're afraid to look at, every place that you want to stay distant from. He says, come on closer and see. Because when Peter came in closer to take a look, he saw something. He may not have perceived it all and comprehended it all or understood it all in that moment, but this is what he was seeing, that death had been defeated. This was not like Lazarus who raised from the dead. And you can read the account in John chapter 11 where Lazarus comes out of the tomb and he's still bound by his grave clothes. Jesus is not bound by grave clothes. For Lazarus, when he came forth, he would die again. He was still still mortal. But when Jesus rose from the grave, when Peter was able to go in and see the tidy scene and, and look a bit closer, he, he was able to perceive that, that death had been defeated, that hell had been defeated, that Jesus was the immortal, wise, almighty king who had defeated all that stood in his way to reconcile man and woman back to God. When you look closer, things are revealed to you that cannot be revealed at a distance. So Jesus lovingly looks at you today and he says, come closer, see this empty tomb and look at what it means for your situation. If darkness distorts and distance influences perception, there's something else that this text reveals in verses 8 through 9. And it's this theme, decision. Write that down, decision. Look again in verses 8 and 9. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. Come on, type that in. He saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the Scripture that he must rise from the dead. Decision. A closer look will lead you to the moment of decision. There is no on the fence type life with Jesus. Either he was the Son of God who was crucified, buried, rose again, and ascended to the right hand of God, or he's not. When you look closer, it brings you to the moment of decision. And Peter's boldness in going in for a closer look and evaluating the scene did something for John. For John, the one who was afraid perhaps to confront what could be, now felt empowered by Peter's example to go in. He no longer stayed at a distance to peep into the tomb. He went in to see, wait a minute, this, this head cloth is wrapped in tidy. No, no grave robber would do this. Wait a minute, they, they didn't fully understand, but, but this belief started to rise in John's heart because of Peter's bravery and his decision to look closer. And I'm telling all of you watching today, someone else's decision may hinge upon your decision. Someone else's decision may hinge upon your decision to look closer at the activity of Jesus in this season. For John, the writer of this gospel, the writer of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, the writer of Revelation, he was kind of brought to life, spiritually speaking, in this moment by Peter's willingness to go take a closer look. I can imagine that when John experienced great torment and persecution and suffering and the Roman authorities tried to kill him, and then they exiled him in isolation on the Isle of Patmos. In all of these moments, I think what ran through his mind was walking into that tomb and taking a closer look that this is not in vain, but that which I give my life for, I saw and I believed because Peter led the way and it opened a door for me to the place of decision to accept that Jesus did indeed rise from the dead. He is indeed who he said that he was and is and will always be. Darkness distorts our view, all the darkness that we face. We can remain at a distance 
and never fully grasp what God is trying to teach us, show us, or reveal to us. But this Easter Sunday, he pulls us in for a closer look to the moment of decision. I want to invite you in this moment to really focus in on what God is speaking to you and what he's been saying to you this whole time I've been preaching. This is the moment of decision. This is the time of decision. Maybe you've lived for Jesus for a long time, but you've kind of slacked off and you've moved away from intimacy with him and and you're ready to rededicate your life today and say, I want this to be the first day for me. I want it to be a new doorway to to a new life one marked with intimacy and love for Jesus. Or maybe you're watching, you say, I've never made a decision. I've always stayed at a distance and criticized and found holes to poke through and just found ways to critique and criticize Christians and the church and Jesus and scripture. But now I've come to look closer and I'm here at the moment of decision. This is your time. Today is the day of salvation. Paul told the Roman believers, he said, If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Experiencing the new life and the new view that Jesus wants to give you today takes renouncing and repenting of those activities and behaviors that went against God and broke his heart, saying that you are accepting that you're making the decision that he is now the leader and the master of your life. He calls the shots. And now to walk in relationship with him through attending and being part of a church community, living in the word of God and being in the place of prayer to grow in your relationship with Jesus. I want to pray that prayer with you right now. If that's you, you can comment in and say, I'm ready to make a decision. I'm ready. We'll pray with you. We'll chat with you. We'll talk with you. We'll Zoom conference with you. We will partner with you in this journey of knowing Jesus and this pathway of discipleship. So I want to pray this prayer. And if you believe this in your heart, receive him as your Lord and Savior. The Bible says you will be saved. So Jesus, thank you today for all that you're doing in this moment. Thank you that people feel the convicting, sweet presence of the Holy Spirit tugging at the strings of their heart saying, come closer, come closer. I am the solution. I am the answer relationship with me is the void you've been trying to fill in your life i am the key i am the door so i just want you to pray this with me it's not a magical formula but i just want you to pray this in your own words with me jesus thank you for dying for my sin thank you for suffering in my place but thank you jesus that you didn't stay dead that you rose from the grave with all power and authority in your hand that you ascended to the right hand of the Father where you're praying for us right now. I receive you as my Lord and Savior, and I repent and turn away from all the behaviors and addictions and activities and things that I've been involved in that would break your heart. And I turn to you in this moment. I surrender all that I am to you. I make you the Lord and Savior of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, You're a new creature. It's a new day. It's the first day of life with Jesus and a journey that will take you to unimaginable places. It will give you a view of life that you never dreamed of. God bless you, and we thank you for joining us this Easter Sunday.